Well, praise God, it is good to see everybody tonight. Welcome back to another We are going to, I believe, see some great things from the Word of God. Just tell your neighbor sitting there beside you, say, I believe you're going to hear everything God wants you to hear. Hallelujah. God is so good to us. Amen. Well, we had been on a series for a number of weeks <coughs> entitled Built in Mercy. And uh, I, I believe we ministered along those lines 10 or 11 weeks. Should minister. And the Lord began to deal with me uh, specifically on. Uh, uh, it would have been Monday evening and into Tuesday to uh, begin to minister a new series. And so that's what we're going to get into tonight. And I'll tell you the name in just a minute, but I want to preface it with this. This for my respect that the thing that we see lacking in the church in the day and age that we live in is a lack of doctrine, of solid doctrine in the church. And remember that doctrine can simply be identified and uh, uh, translated when you say doctrine. It's doctrine is what you believe, all right? And there's largely a, a loss of good, solid doctrine in many churches today. And some time ago, Rick Renner said something, and I've, I've kept it, and he said this, I'll read it to you. He said, pure preaching of doctrine has largely been replaced by motivating, uplifting messages that the majority of people in the pews are ignorant of the most elementary aspects of New Testament doctrine. So that most of the people in the pews are ignorant of the most elementary aspects of New Testament doctrine. He said, often those who occupy the pulpits while masterful communicators and rate highly among motivational speakers, they themselves are not educated in basic Bible principles or no longer preach it because it isn't as popular as other types of messages. Now that, that's telling, all right? If, if the preacher and the teacher, if the pastor is ignorant of basic Bible doctrine, the people are going to be ignorant of basic Bible doctrine. That, that's why when you, look, when you look over the years, uh, P.C. Nelson, uh, who dad, uh, Brother Hagin called Dad Nelson. You know, P.C. Nelson was one of the greatest Greek and Hebrew scholars uh, in, in the world during his day. And uh, uh, I'm saying this for a reason. He wrote the book for the Assembly of God entitled Bible Doctrines. That denomination, the denomination of the Assembly of God, thought it was so important that their ministers know basic Bible doctrine that they commissioned him to write a book on Bible doctrines so that they could be versed in it. Hallelujah. Do, do you see this? Bible doctrine, what you believe. He went on and said, As a result, a drift from the Bible continues unabated, and, do, a, and a doctrinal vacuum is being created in the church that is filled with exceptional business ideas, motivational messages, but not the Word of God that the Holy Spirit is bound to honor with signs and wonders. Hallelujah. Some of what is preached is helpful. But listen, 
but the same help could be purchased in a book by a psychological guru. When everything is said and done, only the Bible has the power to permanently transform. Hallelujah. Only what the Bible says has the ability to permanently transform. And so tonight we want to begin a new series that I've entitled The Nature of God. And you could put in parentheses or as a subtopic, uh, God's essence. When you say the essence of something, you're saying when you boil it down, this is, this is the essence of this. All right, God's nature or the essence of God. Now, during this series, we're going to deal with different things. Uh, we're going to look at these events that I believe the Holy Spirit would have us look at. We're, we're going to look at uh, the fall of man. Uh, we're going to look at Noah's flood, Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to ask and answer the question, does God send evil spirits? Amen. And we're going to ask and answer the question, has Satan been authorized by God? Now, maybe for some of you, you might shake your head and say, well, my Lord, I don't, you know, of course I know that's wrong. But why do you know it's wrong? That there are Bible answers for everything that there's a question for. Hallelujah. Are you believing with me? God's going to God's going to minister to us. Amen. So the nature of God. What I know about God and his nature will determine how I believe. What I know about God and his nature will determine how I believe. It will also determine what I believe for. This is important. Because we determine God's nature according to what the Word of God says. Hallelujah. I can't, I can't tell you how many times uh, I've heard people in churches and, and they'd say, well, you know, this is what we believe. Okay, well, that's okay as long as what you believe is in line with what the Word of God says. If it's not in line with what the Word of God says, then that belief structure, that belief system is in error. All right? In John 17 and verse 17, it's a familiar scripture to all of us in, the, in our faith builders churches. But remember what it says. Jesus was praying. And he made the statement, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So the word and what the word says is absolute truth. Hallelujah. One of the meanings of truth here is this. What is true in things appertaining to God and the duties of man. So what that's telling us is this. We find the truth about God in God's Word. Not from our own experience or someone else's experience. I believe that no Christian should be left in the dark about God's nature. And, 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 and if God's nature is illuminated and if it's, if it's brought out, then we wouldn't have questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? Why did God allow this? We're going to deal with these things tonight. Why did God allow this? Why, why did this happen? Why did that happen? If God's so good, why is there this and why is there that? And I don't understand. If God's a healer, why am I still sick? If, if God's a blesser, why am I struggling? And, and very often, especially in our circles, we have a pat answer. Well, you just, you don't have enough faith. You're not believing. Well, but if I don't know what I'm supposed to believe, how can I take the faith I have and apply it? Hallelujah. 
if you don't know that I'm a good person and that I love you and that I want to help you, how could you exercise any belief that that's my desire? You couldn't. And if a wrong thought process was introduced, that, you know, pastor would just let you suffer to teach you a lesson. Amen. Then when you start suffering, you're certainly not going to come to me because it might be my will to teach you a lesson. Amen. Tell your neighbor, you find the truth about God in the Word of God. Experience, hear me, is not truth. And experience is not truth. And here's why I say this. Uh, of course, m many of you drive to work there in the metro area, and uh, you, know, you know what time that I-35 is backed up, and what direction it's backed up. Amen. Well, a person may go to Kansas City and have an experience of hitting some bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. And they come away saying, oh, that traffic is bumper to bumper. It's, uh, it's been my experience that it's always bumper to bumper. Every day, it's always bumper to bumper. Now, this is a simple illustration. But there are times it is bumper to bumper, but it is not bumper to bumper all the time. They had an experience, but that experience is not truth. Do you hear me? That experience is not truth. It may be true that something happened, but your experience is not necessarily truth. It may be true that you knew somebody that was a good believer that got sick with a disease and died, but that doesn't make it true that God's not a healer. Hallelujah. I saw a pastor one time on a television show, this pastor had lost his son to very questionable circumstances. And he said he went to the Lord about it. Now listen. And the Lord told him, just accept what I allow. Just accept what I allow. The, the, the indication was that the son took his life. And the pastor said, the Lord said, just accept what I allow. Hallelujah. Twice, the same minister said, the Lord told him that two people dying, one from cancer, and the other one that died was a very young man. He said, the Lord told him that was his will and his choice, so just accept what I allow. Now, those statements go exactly contrary to the Word of God. They go exactly contrary to the Word of God. Why? Because if you keep going down that line, then every abused child, God is allowing it, so just accept it. Every person caught in the slave trade and sex trafficking, God allows it, so just accept it. Don't do anything about it. Don't stand up against it. Just accept it. Every abused wife, every woman that is abused by an abusive husband, husband, excuse me, God allows it, so just accept it. Well, we know that's ludicrous. Because, because where do you stop with that? Every person that gets cancer, God allowed it, so just accept it. Well, Part of accepting it would just be to die with it. If, if you accept something, you don't, you don't try to fight it. You don't try to get help. You, you understand? This is an extreme example. I understand. Hallelujah. Another minister whose father was not saved, the minister said he prayed and told the Lord, Lord, whatever it takes to get him saved. And he said it wasn't that long after that they found that he had cancer. Now, what was intimated in that, what I heard, I didn't, just, I didn't hear that somebody said this. I heard them say it with my own ears. 
what was implied was that the cancer was used by God to get his father saved. And he said the Lord spoke to him and told him, don't pray for healing, just accept my will. Don't pray for healing, just accept my will. Now I can imagine what you're thinking. Oh, pastor, that, of course we don't believe that. Right. But why do people believe that? They don't have sound doctrine. They don't have sound doctrine. These are extreme examples, and they should be foreign to our mindset. And I know they're extreme, but let me ask you this. This is what I, what I want to really dig into. What about the believer who believes that in some remote, far-off fashion, some remote, far-off kind of way, that God is allowing something, and so therefore He is responsible for it. It must be His will because He allowed it. Not, not the person that says, God gave me the cancer, but the person that says, well, you know, if God allowed it, then he must be okay with it. You understand? If God allowed it, and I've had people say that, well, you know, if God allowed it, then doesn't that mean that, you know, he's all right with it? No, it doesn't. doesn't mean that. And, and here again is where a pat answer comes in, and I've heard people say, God allows what we allow, and just leave it at that. That may be true, in its essence, but it's not helpful in its explanation. Amen. That's kind of like the statement somebody will say, well, you know, why did this happen? Hey, it is what it is. Well, it might be what it is, but that's not helpful in its explanation. The Apostle Peter said, you need to always be ready to give a reason or an account for why you believe what you believe. So, I know that most of you, and I say most of you because on any given service, I may not know everyone in the service. I know that most of you do not believe that it's God's will for anybody to be sick and anybody to die. But what about that person, as I said, that in some remote, far-off kind of way believes God's allowing this. Well, let's look at it. In the book of James, chapter 1, James, chapter 1, and we'll spend quite a bit of time in James 1 during these services tonight, this service tonight. James 1 and verse 13. He says, let no man say, when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. When it says, let no one say, what this means is, not even one man, one woman, one thing, nobody, no one, nothing. Not even one man, woman, thing, nobody, no one, nothing. So let nobody, no one, not even one man, woman, or thing say that God is associated with evil. Notice how emphatic that is. Don't let anybody, anything, no one, nothing, man or woman, say God is associated with evil. All right? The, 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 the Woost Bible says, For God is incapable of being solicited to sin, and He Himself solicits no one to sin. Notice the word. He is incapable of being associated with evil. That's good news. God is incapable of being associated with evil. Remember this statement. 
whatever God is, He is 100% that. Well, two times in the book of John, 1 John, we're told that God is love. James tells us that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness. All right? So from the Word of God, we see that God is love and God is light. Well, light and love are never associated with evil. God is not okay with evil, and He does not use evil. He's not okay with it, and He doesn't use it. God is not okay with anybody being hurt. God's not okay with anybody suffering poverty. God's not okay with anybody suffering from sickness or disease. All of those things came as a result of the curse. They are part of the evil that came into the earth when Adam opened the door to sin. And God, God paid a horribly hefty price to free us from the bondage of evil. Hallelujah. In the strongest language possible, James says no one, not one man or woman, can say that God has anything to do with evil. Nothing. When a person says, well, God allowed it, they're saying God was okay with it, so he's really responsible for it. Because he allowed it. Well, if God allowed it, then, I mean, ultimately, isn't he responsible for it? That is fatalism. And fatalism is basically this. You've heard the saying, whatever will be, will be. That's fatalism. Fatalism says, well, you know, if God allowed it, no use in me praying against it. It must be his will. Well, but now you've entered into a place of non-resistance. And the Bible says if you don't resist the devil, right, he won't flee from you. So if there's never a resistance offered, amen. And why is there no resistance offered? Because people are largely ignorant of the word. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I will not be ignorant of the word. Tell your other neighbor, I will not be ignorant of the word. Glory to God. Understand and keep this in your mind. God is never okay with evil triumphing. Never. And I say this without, without uh, hesitancy, especially in the life of his children. He is never okay with evil triumphing. There in James 1 verse 16, notice what it says. Do not err, my beloved brethren, Every good and every, now notice these words, every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The New English translation says, do not be led astray. The Amplified Classic says, do not be misled. So what do we gather from this? It is misleading and a misrepresentation of God to say He has anything to do with evil. That's misleading. And, and I'm going to say this as strong as I can. And ministers that stand in the pulpit and indicate or lead people to believe that God has something to do with evil, they are misrepresenting God and they are misleading their people. 
just as much as a person that stands in the pulpit and says God is okay with, you know, with, with a person sinning and, and you, know, you, you just do your best and, and, and God's okay with it. That's a misrepresentation and that's misleading. But the other is just as misleading. Hallelujah. Am I helping you? So he said, do not err. Do not be led into error. It also means to sever or fall away from the truth. Don't fall away from the truth. What's the truth we're looking at? God has no association with evil. Don't be severed from that. See, that's where you put your faith. You might be facing a challenge, but you understand where the challenge is coming from. It's not coming from God. God, the Bible says over and over again. Pastor Michelle preached that profound, phenomenally wonderful message on God being our strength and our rock and our hope and our help and our strong tower. God is where we run in the time of trouble. Father God helps us overcome. He gives us the strength to overcome. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 that when we are tempted, that God is the one that makes a way to escape it. And that temptation is not only a temptation to sin, it's a temptation to give in, it's a temptation to succumb, it's a temptation when the pressure's on, God's the one that provides a way out of it. Glory be to God. And notice he says, don't be severed from that truth. Don't, do not be severed. Don't fall away from that truth. What truth? God's not associated with evil. Amen. One minister said he was, he's battling a disease and we don't make light of that. But he said, the Bible says, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And then he made this statement. But we might ask for healing and it's not God's will for us. So that means we're not asking according to his will. Understand what, he, what, he, what he's saying. He's saying you might go to God and ask God to heal you. But it's not His will, so therefore you're not asking according to His will for you. Now, now listen to me, faith builders. What is God's will? All right, everybody say it. His Word. Right? What is God's Word? Here's how you answer. His will. God's Word is His will. God's will is His Word. When John said that, he was referencing the Word of God that we have. If we ask anything according to His will, we know that He heareth us. And if we know He hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. That's plain. But because of someone's experience... Someone did not receive a healing. Maybe someone's having to stand like this dear man of God, having to stand, not seeing the results he wants to see. And he says, I've asked for healing, and I know it's not a faith issue. Yes, it is. It's a faith issue in what God's will is. See, he has faith that God can heal. He does not have faith that it is God's will to heal him. Do you see the difference? There's a difference between believing God can heal and having faith that it's God's will to heal you. But if you say it's not always God's will to heal, then you have to, by necessity, say God is associated with evil. Hallelujah. Well, what is this? This is being led into error. That's error. He said, do not err in James. Every good 
and every perfect gift comes down from above. What's the implication here? That every bad and imperfect gift is not from above. It's not from above. Now see, that leads to another question. And we're going to deal with it as we move on in this series. I'll touch on it briefly. Well, you know, then if something bad comes on a person, God allows it, uh, He let the devil do that. I've seen a rash of this recently. You know, that, that evil is in the world because God allows it. Listen, answer this question. Why is evil in the world? Did God allow it? Or did Adam allow it? Adam allowed it. And because God had put Adam in charge and gave him, gave him, <laughs> he gave him, had given him authority and dominion and the right to exercise that authority and dominion to protect and keep the place that he was. When Adam abdicated his authority and bowed his knee to a fallen angel, evil came into the world because of Adam's transgression. Not because God allowed it. Hallelujah. Well, God allowed Adam to sin, and he knew Adam was going to sin, and God allowed it, so why did God allow it? Because God had given Adam the authority and the right to exercise that authority in the earth. He told Adam what was going to happen. He, he, he painted a picture for him. He said, don't do this. When you do this, you will surely die. Everything, Adam, will fall apart. Are you following me? God has never been, even under the Old Covenant, and sometimes people try to paint God this way, God has never been somebody that is just some sort of puppet master in heaven that's yanking people's strings and making them do things. Even under the Old Covenant, God allowed people to do whatever they wanted to do. Then when judgment would come on them, He would say, here's why the judgment came. Because you chose not to do what I told you to do. In the book of Proverbs, when it's talking about wisdom, it makes this statement. It says, look, when you despise wisdom, and you despise instruction, and you despise my word, what did God say? He said, then when calamity, when trouble comes on you, it's going to be because you despised my word. That word despise, you made light of it. So ministers will lead you to believe that, the God, that God has allows the devil to run loose on the earth to somehow keep people in check and that God has some kind of ulterior motive for using the devil and that ultimately all of the devil's tactics are working together for your good because God is behind that and the devil can only do what he does because God allows him. And he's on a short leash or he's on a long leash, whichever one they believe, but he can only go so far and eventually God will tell him to stop. That's far enough. The problem with that is there's no New Testament scripture to back that up. In the New Testament, we're told that the shield of faith will quench every fiery dart of the wicked. In the New Testament, we're told to resist the devil and he will flee from us. In the New Testament, we're told to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In the New Testament, we're told whatsoever is born of God sinneth not, and the wicked one cannot touch him. That's what we're told in the New Testament. Now, how do you reconcile that with God has the devil on a short leash. Well, you can't. You can't. Amen. You can't. So when people say, why does God allow evil? Adam allowed evil. And, and God, who is just, amen, amen, had to allow what the person he had placed in charge allowed. 
Glory to God. But, notice, here's something that you don't hear taught a lot. God already had a plan in place to fix it. That's how good He is. That's how disassociated from evil God is. He had a solution before there was ever a problem. Hallelujah. That, listen, God had Isaiah, had Isaiah 53 and 5 before Isaiah ever existed. Do you hear me? God had the cure for every sickness in the earth before the sickness ever existed. God had the cure for man's transgression already planned and ready to go before the transgression ever occurred. Why? He is completely disassociated with evil. He has nothing to do with it. He has only something to do with the eradication and the defeat of evil. That's it. Amen. Well, why does God let the devil afflict people? Well, for believers, He's given us the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Is that what Scripture says? For the non-believer, the Bible says they are held under the sway of the wicked one. Their minds are blinded by the devil. They're living after the devil and after the flesh and after the things of sin. Somebody that doesn't want anything to do with God can never expect to experience the goodness of God because there has to be a moment in time when they come to themselves and say, I need to make a change, I need to make Jesus my Lord, and then they can begin to walk in the blessings associated with a God who is only associated with good and blessings and healings and victory for His people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whew, I don't know if I've helped you, but I've preached myself happy. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. But great theologians will write masterful works on why God allows the devil to do this and why God allows the devil to do that. God doesn't allow it. There are laws that were set in motion with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When He ascended to the right hand of the Father, He not only ascended to take a break and take a rest, He ascended with the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He ascended with all authority and all power and all might and all dominion in His possession. And He gave that to the church and seated us in the heavenly places with Him far above all principality and might and power and dominion and every name that is named. And the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that, God, that, 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 that the Father is God to the glory, that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you have the power through the name of Jesus to cause that circumstance in your life to bow the knee, to cease in its operation against you. Amen. But listen to me. If you think that God has something to do with it, that won't be a step you'll take. Oh, glory. Am I helping you? In verse 17 again, he says, Every good and every perfect gift comes from above and comes from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Variableness means variation. I like this, or change. God doesn't change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When I was a boy growing up in church, we'd sing that song, I know God is God. God don't ever change. I know God is God. God don't ever change. Right? Hallelujah. He's God on the platform. He's God back at the door. He's God in the amen corner. He's God all over the floor. I know God is God. 
God don't ever change. I know God is God, and He always will be God. I don't know if we knew what we were singing or even believed what we were singing, but we were saying something. God doesn't change. See, you need a revelation of this. Amen. When you're under pressure, a lot of times when people are under pressure, they think what they need is more dedication. When you're under pressure, you need more revelation. And your revelation will increase your dedication. I need to have a revelation of who God is and the nature of God. Amen. Look at John chapter 9. So you have this, like we read earlier, this vacuum of doctrine, and it gets filled with other things. In John 9, verse 1, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, I mean, this is how they were raised. If there was a sickness or a disease, especially something like this, it was the result of either that man sinned or his parents sinned. Well, it was the result of Adam's sin. The reason this man was born blind was he was born into an earth with the curse on it. Think about this for a moment. We as believers have the ability to speak over even our unborn children. You may be pregnant with a child watching this in the sanctuary or online, and you're a believer. You have the ability, according to the Word of God, to speak over your child and receive them healthy, whole, and normal at birth. Because you are redeemed, Galatians 3.13, from the curse. Amen. These people were not redeemed from the curse. And so this man was born into an earth with a curse on it. And blindness is part of the curse. He was born blind. So the disciples weren't mean or hard-hearted. That's what they were taught. Notice what Jesus answered. Neither has he sinned nor his parents. Now that doesn't mean they never sinned. It means they didn't sin and bring this on. It's not the result of sin. Now notice, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now right there, you'll hear people say, well, you know, right there, look, it, it wasn't sin. Jesus said it was so that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Well, now, let's look at this. Neither is this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. He did not say this man was born blind for this purpose, so the works of God could be manifest in him. I'm going to show you this from, from what this word means. But many have said that this man being born blind was God's will so that the power of God could be shown in him. The verb, the, the word manifest here is a verb, and the verb translated manifest here suggests future result, not the reason for the man's blindness. That the works of God should be made manifest in him. In other words, listen. The blindness is not the work of God. The work of God is what's going to happen in the future to this man. Are you clear with that? The word translated suggests something future. Jesus is not saying this blindness is the work or the will of God. He's saying it wasn't their sin 
that brought it on him. Amen. But the fact that he was born blind, the works of God are going to be manifest in him. Hallelujah. And then notice what Jesus said. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Amen. Then what did he do? When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. I must work the works of him that sent me, put clay in his eyes, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man went and washed, and God healed him. Blindness cannot be the work of God, and healing be the work of God. Do you see this? Sickness cannot be God's work, and healing be God's work. Because if it were, then God would change. He's either the healer or the afflictor. Well, we've already read from James where it says he's not associated with evil. So he can't be the afflictor. Matter of fact, James went on and said, Is there any afflicted? Let him pray. Amen. Is any happy? Let him sing. Well, what's the indication there? If you're afflicted, pray, and God will relieve you of your affliction. If you're sick, call for the elders of the church. They'll lay hands on you. They'll anoint you with oil. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. Watch this. And the Lord will raise him up. Hallelujah. Now, think about this for a moment. Why didn't he say, is there any afflicted? Let him endure it bravely. Let him just hold on till the going on comes on. Because God might have a purpose in it. Amen. Is there any sick among you? Hey, just bear your cross bravely. It might not be God's will to heal you. Just do your best. Keep a good thought. After all, if you do die with that sickness, you'll get healed when you get to heaven. No. He said, if you're sick, take these steps, and the prayer of faith that they pray will save the sick, and the Lord, the healer, will raise them up. Amen? So we can see the blindness was not the works of God. The giving of sight to this man was the works of God. Is that clear? Now, back in James chapter 1, I've only got a couple more verses for you. James chapter 1 and verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Swift to hear what? Verse 13. God doesn't use evil. Be swift to hear that. God's not okay with evil. God's not okay with sickness. He's not okay with poverty or, dis or, or, or destruction. Why is this so important? Because this is the nature of your Father. In John 10.10, 10, a familiar passage of Scripture. See, you've got to know what you believe and then stay with what you believe. I've, I've watched people over the years that faced a challenge, maybe faced a challenge physically, or faced a challenge where, where healing was concerned. And that situation totally changed their belief system.
Amen. Well, well, Pastor, if somebody doesn't get healed, you know, and, 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 and God didn't heal him, well, isn't he okay with it? No, because of the price he paid. By his stripes, you are healed. The price is paid. Think about this for a moment. If, uh, I go down to the grocery store and purchase $300 worth of groceries. And I, 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 I put them in a certain location. And I know that you need food. And I tell you, I have $300 worth of groceries in the refrigerator in the back of the church. All you have to do is just go by and get it. I, I bought it all for you. Just go get it. Amen. And you never act on that. Amen. And you go without food until you're sick. You go without food until you're emaciated. You understand what I'm saying here? Was I okay with you being hungry and not having? No. I paid the price. I went and bought a whole refrigerator full of groceries. Yeah, but why didn't you just bring it and give it to me? I did. I made it available. I told you where it was. I explained to you how to get it. It's there. I've told you the story about the friend of mine that the guy came up to him and said, Boy, I sure like that suit. He said, Really? He said, Where do you get them? He said, Well, I have them special made at a tailor shop in Texas. He said, Boy, I sure like that. And he said, Well, look, I want to buy you a couple suits. He said, Okay. He said, I'm going to call them. They got my credit card on number, he said, on, on record. He said, I'm going to order you two suits. And all you have to do is go in and get fitted, and, and, and they'll give them to you, and they'll charge my card. The guy said, all right, great, wonderful. He said, I called the place a couple weeks later and said, that guy ever come in? He said, no, never did. He said, okay. He said, I called back about two months later. So that guy ever come in? Never did. Never did come in. He said he liked the suit. He said he wanted a suit. The price was paid, and he never went and picked it up. Now, there was another guy that said the same thing, and he took the same steps. He said, my credit card's on file. He said, I'll order you a couple suits. You go in and pick them up. He said, I called in just a few days later and asked the guy. I said, hey, that guy come in? He said, yeah, he come in like a couple days after you called. What's the difference? One person believed and acted on the price that was paid. The other person said they wanted, but wouldn't act on the price that was paid. Do, do you see this? What you believe about God and His nature will determine how and what you believe. So that person that we were talking about earlier, they can sit in their home hungry and say, well, pastor don't care about me. Pastor don't care. This hunger must be His will. No, if it was my will, would I have paid the price I paid? No, I wouldn't. The cross is the answer to everything. If it was God's will that anybody be without, whether it's salvation, healing, prosperity, or victory, if it was God's will that anybody be without any of those things, He would have never sent Jesus to die on the cross. He only sent Jesus to die on the cross because it is His will that all mankind experience salvation. And salvation is not just going to heaven when you die. It is God's will that you be blessed that you be healed, that you be victorious in this life, that you overcome the devil on every score. God did not place an enemy in the earth to help keep you in check. 
Adam allowed God's arch enemy to take authority in this earth and through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God gave us back the authority and the dominion that Adam abdicated and we have full authority and full dominion over the devil. Glory be to God. So John 10, 10, he says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. Now let me kind of hurry here a little bit. When it says the thief comes to steal, and I know to kill, steal, and destroy, and, and we say that's the dividing line of the Bible, and it is. But understand how he does this. This word steal it means to, to steal in an artful, sneaky, undercover kind of way. So the devil doesn't just show up and say, Hi, I'm the thief. I'm going to steal from you. That won't work. What does he do? He's conniving. He works. He schemes. He plots. He plans. On how, to, on how to steal from you. Well, one of the way he, ways he steals from people is keeping them ignorant of God's nature. Keeping them ignorant of God's desire. So he steals and he does so in a conniving, in an, in an artful way. To steal, to kill. All right? Well, a lot of times when we think kill, we just think murdering someone. Well, that's true, but this word also means in the way of a sacrifice. So in other words, the devil will artfully try to steal from you, and if he cannot use his conniving deceptiveness to steal from you, then he will try to get you to sacrifice what belongs to you and ultimately destroy you. By what? You giving up what belongs to you. Sacrificing it. Every time somebody says, well, it may not be God's will to heal me, they're sacrificing healing. Every time somebody says, well, I wonder if God's trying to teach me something through this, they're sacrificing their victory. You see, the devil couldn't steal it from them, but they offered it up as a sacrifice. Isn't that something? And then, steal, kill, and destroy. That's the ultimate goal. Complete destruction of the life that God planned for you. Amen. That's his goal. That's what that word means. Complete and utter destruction. That's the goal. But notice, that's only half the verse. Jesus said, I am come. And, and I like this, because it's emphatic in the Greek. And Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But then it's like he stands up and goes like this and says, but here, look, I am come. This is why I came. That you might have life, and have it more abundantly. The Amplified Bible says, to the full until it overflows. The Greek denotes the highest form of life that is available. That's what God wants for us. That's what God wants. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God came, Jesus came, to give you the highest form of life that's available. And guess what? Those lines never cross. They, 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 they never blur. This is so important. They never cross. God is never a part of stealing or killing or destroying. And I'm going I'm to leave you with this. Never blur those lines. Listen to me. I don't care who you know. And I don't care what you know happened to them. You know what you believe and stay with what you believe. Don't blur those lines. Amen. One time there was a minister that was uh, 
doing a funeral for a young girl that had been killed in an automobile accident by a drunk driver. And I had a family member that was at that funeral, and he heard the minister say it. The minister came to the family, and he said, you know, we don't know why God took your daughter. Well, see, he just blurred the lines. Everybody say this out loud. God is not the taker. God is the giver. That's what the Bible says about your father, that he's the giver of life, not the taker of life. I remember being just a young boy and hearing a, 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 a long playing record album from a minister that was in the, the voice of healing. And he saw wonderful miracles and signs, but he preached a message. One of his most popular messages was God is a killer. God is a killer. And, and, he, and, he, and he went through different scriptures in the Word of God and took them out of their context, of course, where death came on people because they violated what God had said. And he said, look, this, this is what will happen. And he used it as appeal to get people saved, that you could walk out of this tent tonight unsaved, and before you get home, you could die in your sin. You could be in an automobile accident. Something horrible could happen to you. And the implication was that God would have a hand in it because you didn't walk the aisle tonight and give your life to God. Am I helping you all with this? God doesn't get mad at people because they don't get saved. When a person doesn't get saved, they're open to what the enemy wants to do. God kills no one. Well, but he killed Ananias and Sapphira. We'll deal with that in this series. Show me the scripture where it says God killed Ananias and Sapphira. It doesn't say it. Did they lie to the Holy Ghost? Yes. Then there's a very strong implication that they might not have even been born again. Or at the very least didn't believe what was going on. And, and that's a whole other message. But here's my point. That was always implied when I was growing up. You could walk out of here, and, and, and that was always the story that was told. I knew a young man. Oh, the call was given to repent, and he steadfastly refused to, to, to re respond to that altar call, and he went out of that church and got on his motorcycle and ran into a truck and died. I'm not making fun. That really happened. But the implication there was that because he didn't respond to the altar call, there was death awaiting him and God had something to do with it. I thought that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God defeated death. So, so, so God's out working with a defeated enemy? God's working with death even though he sacrificed his son to eradicate death? No. My family, no. Never. Let me end with this. I remember Pastor Michelle and I, I want to end on a higher note, coming out of the radio station where we were recording our broadcast many years ago. And there was a dear man, dear friend of ours. I, I, I mean no slight to him by saying this. He's in heaven today. But he had had a stroke. He was in his 70s. He had had a stroke. And he had been gone for probably a month or better. And we were so delighted to see him back in the radio uh, 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 studio recording their program. And we went out, and of course, Pastor Michelle, just in her loving way, she, she went up to him and, and grabbed his hand, called his name, said, Oh, brother, it's so good to see you. We've missed you so much. And he looked at her, and he said, Yeah. He said, I was doing too much, and the Lord had to slow me down by that stroke. And without even hesitancy, no, no stuttering, Pastor Michelle looked at him now sweet and kindly, but very directly, and said, how dare you talk about my father that way? Now, let me explain this. What did we see in that moment? Someone who had no 
doctrinal stability about the nature of God and another person who immediately answered it because they did have a correct view of the nature of God. Hallelujah. Let me end here. God is for you. God desires good for your life. God wants you healed and well and blessed. There's evil in the world, and God knows there's evil in the world. But we have victory over the evil in the name of Jesus. Well, the prayer ministers are coming right now to the altar. They will minister to you if you're in need of prayer. If you would like them to agree with you concerning anything, uh, they will be available even after we say our vision. They'll be there until the end of service. And uh, you can come up and they'll pray with you. They are trained, uh, personally trained, uh, by Pastor Michelle and I. They know how to pray. They know what to believe with, uh, believe with you about. And so if you would like prayer, uh, please just come up and they will lay hands on you and agree with you in Jesus' name. Well, stand up, everybody. God is so good to us. I'm excited about this series. I'm really excited about what God's going to show us. And it's going to be wonderful. Amen. Don't forget now Sunday morning. Uh, we'll be there at 10 o'clock ministering the Word of God. And then Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we'll be back as well. Be sure to invite somebody because exciting things are happening in our churches and lives are being changed. Amen. Well, come on, say it with me. The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you.